Florida State Seminoles should be resting comfortably in their beds tonight, while the tribe should be downright exhausted after all the activities on this Sunday. Bob Warren gives us a view from start to finish. For those who thought the Gator Bowl was for the birds and boring, you didn't know about Sunday. To cover everything, you needed a horse, a float, or a boat. The coat was optional. The day of rest began for both teams with worship services. That was as restful as it got. For some Florida State players, it was on to Wolfson's Children's Hospital to spend part of the afternoon with terminally ill children. The Oklahoma State Cowboys headed for the high seas, touring a couple of Navy frigates. We're the meanest uh, anti-submarine warfare frigate in the Atlantic Fleet. So we'd like for you to, to wear this to, you know, underneath something tomorrow and uh, <laughs> you'll have good luck. For the two head coaches, it was business as usual, meeting the press for the final time before Monday's game. It sounded just like all the others. We need a, uh, I think for us to win the game, I need a star to evolve. Somebody needs to, I need to pick up that paper Tuesday morning and say, out of nowhere came so-and-so. Where did he come from? Who is this guy? That's what we need to happen. I think we've got something accomplished. I don't sure it guarantees you nothing, but we have had good practices. So, you know, as far as getting tired of being down here, no, really. Then it was time to strike up the band. Just when it looked as if it would rain on the Gator Bowl's first parade in 27 years, the clouds broke, the sun peeked through, and it was on with the show. <laughs> water. It was supposed to be a gala extravaganza to open the St. John's River Walk, but only a dozen or so boats showed up, some though flying their garnet and gold colors. For dinner, a seafood feast fit for the king size. For entertainment, a little down-home Seminole boogie. The game between the Cowboys and Indians has failed to spark the public's imagination. After three straight years of setting attendance bowl records, the 41st annual Gator Bowl is somewhat of a dud. Tomorrow night's expected crowd between 60 and 65,000. The Seminoles come in as solid seven-point favorites. This is Bob Warren, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports at the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville. Okay, the fishing and hunting hour, body. We're less than two hours away now from the kickoff of tonight's 41st edition of the Gator Bowl. At 8.08 p.m., the Florida State Seminoles will meet the final test of this 1985 season, facing the Cowboys from Oklahoma State. This will be a game of mirrors. Both the Cowboys and Seminoles finish the regular season at 8-3, and, and each are coming off huge losses to arch rivals. Bob Warren is standing by live at the Gator Bowl, and Bob, what's a good word? Well, Scotty, the good word tonight is that we're standing under clear skies as opposed to three years ago on this night when the Seminoles beat West Virginia on one of the nastiest nights ever in a driving rainstorm. It may be dry, but so too is it cold. Temperature by games end expected to be around 30 degrees. The bad word tonight is Oklahoma State. These Cowboys may be far tougher to corral than West Virginia, but Florida State has one thing working in its favor, and that's the record book. The Seminoles have never lost in the Gator Bowl. Florida State may have history on its side, but Oklahoma State has talent plus, a triumvirate of all Americans. Heading the list, Outland and Lombardi Trophy finalist Leslie O'Neill, the best pass rusher in the Big Eight with speed of a linebacker and muscle to back it up. He views tonight's game. Uh, it's real important for me. Uh, a lot of people say that I haven't been playing well the last couple of weeks because of injuries, that type of deal. There's a chance for me to redeem myself and, and go out there and play. Uh, I feel like I have something to prove. Uh, I feel like I have to more or less show everybody that I've earned what I've gotten. Then their safety, Mark Moore, the intimidator of the OSU defense with a capital I. His trademark, vicious, hard-hitting tackles. The key to victory for him? If we can throw a couple of blitzes in there every once in a while and uh, make him throw the ball or either, uh, you know, uh, fumble the handoff, uh, you know, that's going to be to our advantage and, you know, that's going to be the key to the game. Then there's All-American Thurman Thomas, a Heisman Trophy caliber running back, the fourth leading rusher in the nation. He's had three 200-yard games this season and is lethal cutting back against the grain. He says the OSU offense still has plenty to offer. Nobody has really seen, you know, what we can do. Uh, you have to go way back to the Miami-Ohio game, you know, when we score a lot of points. You know, so we have something to prove to, uh, to the people and ourselves. The trigger man for the OSU attack is a non-All-American, Ronnie Williams. The book on the sophomore quarterback, a strong arm, but inconsistent. He's ready to play. I'm due for a pretty good game, and uh, I got some warm weather, soft grass, and, uh, and the climate's right. You know, there's nothing that I can say that's going to stop me besides uh, the Seminoles, and uh, I don't think they will. Despite the glittering credentials, Florida State is not at all. They, too, are ready to play. I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm a very positive person, and I think everybody else on the team is, too. I feel like we're going in. I, don't, I can't see us losing. I mean, 
We just came off a tough loss, and, you know, every time we've come off a tough loss, we won the next game, and we killed somebody. Anything can happen. We've got a 16-to-1 turnover ratio in the big games, and that's not working for us right now, and this is a big game for us, so I'm not predicting that we're going to win. But you feel good, don't you? Well, I'm looking forward to playing. And what does Bobby Bowden think it will take to win? I need a star to evolve. Somebody needs to, I need to pick up that paper Tuesday morning and say, out of nowhere came so-and-so. Where did he come from? Who is this guy? That's what we need to happen. So everything's in place. The haze in the barn, so to speak. Thousands of football fans from Godubo, Oklahoma to Coral Gables, Florida have converged on Jacksonville to watch the Cowboys and Indians in the 41st annual Gator Bowl game. We're about an hour and a half away from being knee-deep in hoopla right now, Scotty. The expected crowd tonight far larger than first thought. At last report, only a couple of hundred tickets remained unsold, so expect a crowd of around 80,000 plus. Now, if you're a betting person, the smart money says to put your dough on Florida State. The Seminoles are favored by six. We'll have all the answers for you in about five hours from now. Scott? Bob, earlier this week, you talked about the injuries to Jamie Dukes and Phil O'Brien, the wide receiver from Bainbridge. What is their status for tonight's game? Jamie Dukes and Phillip Bryant both will play. I talked to both of them within the hour. Jamie admits he's very sore. This cold weather is not going to hurt, uh, help his bruised knee at all, but he says he's going to give it his all, make it 48 straight for Florida State. Phillip Bryant's bum ankle also coming around, but he's a little ginger on it. Okay, Bob, thank you very much. Enjoy the ball game tonight. In the next 72 hours, you'll be hit with a total Down of... Jacksonville. Florida State is averaging 33 points a game, eighth best in the nation. Freshman quarterback Chip Ferguson has 13 TDs to his credit this season. The Seminoles' leading rusher is senior Tony Smith with 678 yards and four TDs. This game is a very, very big ball game for us. Uh, you know, like you say, we don't want to lose three in a row. We've been in the top 20 now for two years solid ever since the Arizona State game two years ago. And the loser of this game, I don't think, will stay in the top 20. Uh, so there's, it's very, very important for a lot of reasons. The Oklahoma State Cowboys have one of the best running backs in the country. He is number 34, Thurman Thomas, who this season rushed for over 1,500 yards and 15 touchdowns. On defense, Oklahoma State is led by All-American Leslie O'Neill, number 99. Make no mistake, the Cowboys are a solid football team. Mike Cunningham for NBC News. Well, Bowling Green has given the football. The Seminoles took it easy today. No practice or meetings. It was a time to rest which is just what the doctor ordered for some of the team. Coach Bowden has a sore throat. Several players have complained of the flu, and tailback Tony Smith has a nasty chest cold. Nothing serious, but then Smith could be the key to the Seminole offense. Anytime Tony does well, this team usually does well. Uh, he's a great running back, and he's ready to go. Uh, you know, I talked to him yesterday. We were talking about it, and you know, he says, yes, yeah, it's my last game. i got to do well. And he's really anxious, and uh, if he does well, we'll do well. Coach Bowden has said his number one priority was to throw the ball more consistently. But can he do that with a couple guys named Gaynor and White at the whiteouts? You tell me you're not nervous now, but what about half hour before the game time? What are your emotions going to be? I'll probably have a lot of, uh, you know, butterflies and stuff in my stomach. I'll be real, real nervous then. Uh -huh. You've never caught a pass in a major college game. Does that worry you? No. You think it's going to come tonight? Yes. How important is Hassan Jones to the Seminole offense? Well, the folks who made the official Gator Bowl poster thought he was mighty important. They featured him and OSU Thurman Thomas. Hassan is not going to play, but Jamie Dukes doesn't think that's all that big a deal. How much confidence do you have in Herb Gaynor and Randy White? I've got all the confidence in the world. Um, our receiving core here at Florida State has been great since I've been here. Des McKinnon never started a game while I was here. Uh, Luigi Thompson was a great receiver. Tony Johnson a few years back was a fantastic receiver, and Jesse Heston was a great receiver, and Jesse didn't start till his senior year. You know, we just got a ton of receivers. And I hope all of them catch a lot of passes. The Indians, the battleground Gator Bowl 85, Cowboys and Indians. Brought to you by Hardee's, where good people go for good food. Capital Chrysler Plymouth Dodge. Nobody can beat our deal. Nobody. Wharton Williams Travel of Tallahassee, where the lowest airfares available are guaranteed. Precision Tune, Tallahassee's tune-up specialist. This is where it all began four and a half months ago, the first day in pads. In the late summer heat, Florida State and scores of other college football teams began their quest for bowl bids and national rankings. And this is where the Seminoles and the Oklahoma State Cowboys will end their season tonight, the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville. 
Good evening, everybody. I'm Rich Lenz. In about half an hour, Florida State and Oklahoma State, two teams that have shared remarkably similar seasons to date, will meet in what promises to be a memorable Gator Bowl. It's not the first time these two teams have met in a bowl game, but unless your pursuit of trivia includes bowl games, you're not going to remember when they met the first time. The place, Louisville, Kentucky, the year 1958. It was 10 degrees and the Oklahomans handled the bitter cold better than the Floridians. Just 7,000 people watched as the Cowboys beat the Seminoles 15 to 6. It was the first and last bluegrass bowl. Well, many things will be different tonight. Jacksonville is guaranteed to be warmer than Louisville was, and the crowd would be more like 80,000 this time around. The coach for Florida State in 1958 was Tom Nugent. Now, of course, it's Bobby Bowden. Uh, the last game you play of the season, you'd sure like to win it because it's the memory that lingers on and uh, can help give you some momentum going into the next year. So uh, Oklahoma State and Florida State both come into this ball game needing needing the same things, a win. And yet, uh, I don't know if you should put it on a life and death basis because uh, it's, it's not for the national championship, it's not for the conference championship, it's to try to see who can be the best football team in this bowl. I don't like to associate a loss in a bowl game as fatal disaster. Coach, a lot of pressure on a freshman quarterback, Chip Ferguson. Is he ready to have a great game? Uh, he needs experience, he needs time. He Remember, he came to Florida State back in August with no reading of coverages, no how to handle a blitz, no how to handle this. And, and, and he's having to learn it under fire against good football teams. And uh, so you say, is he ready for this? Uh, we're going to play him like he's ready. We're going to do what we would try to do if we had Jimmy Jordan or Wally Woodham there, who are old, older, mm -hmm. or old hand quarterbacks. And, uh, but uh, we're, we're pushing him a little, little, little too fast, really. Jamie Dukes versus Leslie O'Neill, the best versus the best. Will you run the ball right at Leslie O'Neill? Some great football players you're better running at than away from because when you try to run away from them, they're so fast, they'll catch you. In other words, you make a yard gain, it gets you from behind, you know, that type of thing. Whereas if you run at them, you know right where they are, you, your, your point of attack is at them, and you can double team them and pin them in and might even have a better chance of making yardage. Where is this defense vulnerable? Where can it be attacked? A team can have uh, nine good football players and we have two weak ones. And if you can find out where those two weak ones are and if they can't cover them up somehow, you might build your whole game of playing around that. But they're not a team like that. Hmm. Really, they're a solid football team. Yeah. The main difference they've got on us is the same things that several clubs had on us, on us this year, and that's maturity. They're, they've got a senior nose guard, senior tackle, senior tackle, senior linebacker, senior linebacker, senior defensive end, senior defensive end. Thurman Thomas. Would you like to see him in the uh, FSU backfield? Oh, boy, I think everybody in the country <laughs> would. There were some great backs this year, and uh, people on the western side of Mississippi probably know more about uh, Thurman Thomas than they do about the backs over here. If you can hold Thurman Thomas to under 100 yards, will the Seminoles win this game? If you hold him to under 100 yards? Yeah, if you held him to under 100 yards, you'd have a good chance to win the football game. Coach, fill in the blanks for me. If we do X, Y, and Z well, we'll win the Gator Bowl championship. What are X, Y, and Z? Play with a lot of enthusiasm and execute flawlessly and uh, just have no breakdowns in a kicking game. That would, that would win. And the same goes true. If they did the same thing, they would win. Lewis Field, home of the Oklahoma State Cowboys, and where the Cowpokes practice for their first week before heading down to Jacksonville. According to Coach Jones, when you prepare for the Florida State Seminoles, you prepare for the unexpected. Well, Florida State, yeah, they're the trick play kings. You know, they, uh, they'll deal it all over the place. Well, we occasionally will run summer seven. You know, we threw a quarterback, throw back the quarterback for touchdown this ball game last year. Uh, through shuffle pass, this sort of thing. And, you know, we had a bunch of trick plays in for Oklahoma. Couldn't use them out here because the, the field was so icy, icy and slick. But uh, uh, I'm sure it will. But I don't think anybody will just hammer the ball up inside the entire ball game. Neither team. Although the Cowboys might be tempted to try. At 190 pounds and 4-4 speed in the 40, sophomore All-American Thurman Thomas has the ability to bust it up the middle, break free, and turn on the Jets. 60 yards on the run for Thomas. I have four offensive linemen that are seniors, and this is their last ball game, and I know they're going to be going and, you know, performing at the, at the best of their ability. Things are going right for you on the 30th. 
Will Thomas carry the ball 30, 40 times a game? Probably. Uh, you know, Thurman, we were still basically running offense. You know, Ronnie Williams has a great arm. We're capable of throwing the football, and, and we've done it quite well at times during the year. And we've been effect ineffective at other times. Uh, in Nebraska, we threw, you know, 360-something yards. Then in the little ice storm down here against OU, we only completed five out of 25. Much of their trouble can be attributed to this play against Washington in the season opener. Williams is hurt. Ronnie Williams is hurt. In his first start ever, quarterback Ronnie Williams suffered a compound fracture of his jaw. Williams is completely recovered physically, but mentally he may be vulnerable. If FSU can pressure Williams, as they did Miami's Vinny Testaverde, it could be a long night for the Pokes offense. Of course, Coach Jones doesn't think that'll happen. We were playing at uh, Lawrence, Kansas, and I guess the, about the third play of the ballgame, he took an almost identical shot in the face, not cheap shot, but just got butted in the face and then jumped up. I mean, he's, he's had some hits, so I mean, he, physically he's all right. If Ronnie Williams is having trouble moving the ball, Coach Jones might turn to Thurman Thomas. You see, he can throw the ball as well. If it comes down to where we have to throw, you know, I'll be prepared ready. Okay, the arm's totally healthy. Yes, the arm is healthy. <laughs> Nothing is wrong with the arm. As good as Thurman Thomas is, the heart of this Cowboy team is its defense. And the soul of that defense is two-time All-American Leslie O'Neill. O'Neill isn't huge, 6'3 and 250 pounds. But there isn't a quicker down lineman in the country, college or pro. The big FSU offensive line going up against a smaller OSU defensive line, how much does that worry you? Well, it, it, it worries me, but you got to understand, we, we face Nebraska and Oklahoma every year, you know, and uh, basically in this conference, if you, if you got any sense about you, you're, you're talking two losses automatically. We see some of the biggest and finest offensive linemen in the country every year. We hold our own, and my bottom line to that is you can't hit what you can't see, and I'll leave it at that. They're not really getting the big play, but this could be it on the reverse. Loy Alexander didn't get outside, and your great player, Mark Moore. That's With Hassan Jones unable to play, look for Mark the Hitman Moore to try and bully the young Seminole receivers. We strive on defense, uh, getting the big hits and making the big plays. And any time that you can uh, stick somebody good and get your teammates fired up, and, uh, you know, it just just makes everybody out there want to get want to go out and just hit hard and uh and that's one way we can intimidate our opponents and that's what we like to do there will you try and do that against fsu <laughs> definitely we, we definitely have to do anything we can to win this game on paper the cowboys are a far more experienced team than fsu however most of the 80,000 fans jammed into the gator bowl will be cheering for the seminoles and that's got to help the fsu youngsters hey we're playing a uh, a florida team in the state of florida so we will have we've got to be us against the rest of them unless we can attract a few Gator fans. Now that we've shown you where the Cowboys have been. 1985 marked the 10th anniversary of Bobby Bowden's tenure at Florida State. Before the season began, many thought the Seminoles would be a year away from an outstanding campaign. In Tallahassee, that translates to a 9-2 or 10-1 record. However, the 8-3 record Bowden produced during the regular season was remarkable in many ways because many things failed to go as expected and both the team and the coach were forced to adapt. Florida State defense. The Florida State Seminoles opened the 1985 season in the New Orleans Superdome against Tulane. After some early jitters that led to three first half turnovers, the Knolls turned the green wave into an ebb tide, winning 38 to 17. Touchdown, Florida State. So with victory number one under their belts, the Seminoles came back here to prepare for a very big game number two. Whether anyone wanted to admit it or not, the Tulane game was viewed as just a tune-up. And no one would disagree, you better be well-tuned to take on the Nebraska Cornhuskers in Lincoln. The one thing the Knowles were most concerned with against the Cornhuskers was the big play. And sure enough, Nebraska broke one to take an early lead. Touchdown, Nebraska! But the place kicking of Derek Schmidt and an inspired defense kept the Seminoles close until the offense could produce the winning touchdown. Fullback Cletus Jones burrowed his way into the end zone, allowing Florida State to escape with a 17-13 win. Great victory, Keith. Just a tremendous victory for Florida State. After two road games, the Seminoles hosted a stubborn Memphis State team in the friendly confines of Dope Campbell. Again, Florida State fell behind early. But perhaps the hardest blow dealt by the Tigers came late in the second quarter. For the second consecutive week, Seminole quarterback Danny McManus was knocked unconscious. Senior Kirk Coker was called on in relief and passed the Knolls to victory. The 1910 win raised Florida State's record to 3-0. But was McManus okay? 
Dr. Drew is going to put the, the test all together. Then he's going to make a decision, and when he makes that decision, he's going to call us and let us know what his decision is. Next on the agenda, the Kansas Jayhawks. On the strength of Mike Norris's arm, Kansas led 20-10 in the fourth quarter when freshman quarterback Chip Ferguson subbed for Kirk Coker and promptly threw a 68-yard TD strike to another frosh, Philip Bryant. On their next possession, Ferguson marched the Knolls 62 yards in four plays to win it 24-20. Danny McManus did not play a down. Following the Kansas win, the Knolls had a much-needed open date to heal the wounds and prepare for the undefeated Auburn Tigers. It was no secret that if Florida State was to beat Auburn, they would have to stop eventual Heisman Trophy winner, Bo Jackson. He weighs about 220 pounds and he has world-class speed, so that's gonna present a problem. What we have to do is uh, gang tackle and drive our feet through him or uh, he's gonna run all over us. Jackson had a big day against Florida State, rushing for 179 yards on 30 carries. However, with just over six minutes left, the Seminoles pulled to within four, 31-27 on a 46-yard Derek Schmidt field goal. From there, the game was Auburn's as the Tigers scored four unanswered touchdowns to compile the most points ever scored against Florida State. The final, Auburn 59, FSU 27. Danny McManus played briefly early in the contest. It would be the last time he would play in 85. The Auburn loss was particularly tough on Coach Bobby Bowden. It dimmed the Knowles' chances for an Orange Bowl berth. Florida State still hasn't won in Jordan-Hare, and Coach Bowden hails from that neck of the woods so his chance for bragging rights had eluded him again. The following week in practice, Coach Bowden was all business. No reason we should get beat like we did last week and uh, take somebody lightly. How can we do without Danny? Well, we've survived uh, four out of five games, haven't we? The Seminoles needed a sacrificial lamb to soothe their wounds and found one as the Tulsa Golden Hurricane blew into town. Florida State amassed 462 yards in offense and scored the most points of any Division 1A team in 1985, thumping Tulsa 76 to 14. The following week, the Knowles traveled to Chapel Hill where a late Ferguson to Hassan Jones touchdown salvaged win number six, 20 to 10. Florida State's hopes of a New Year's Day Bowl were still very much alive when Miami visited Tallahassee, but after holding a tenuous 24-14 halftime lead, the Seminoles met the eye of the hurricane. Testaverde pumps, three loads, wide open, touchdown Miami! Vinny Testaverde threw for 339 yards, including two second-half TDs, propelling Miami to a 31-27 victory. Well, I guess they called the right play at the right time. He checks off well, and uh, they called us in the wrong defense at the time. We could have made the play, we just didn't make the play. Coming off loss number two, Florida State again overwhelmed its following opponent. Freshman running backs Keith Ross and Victor Floyd combined for 354 yards rushing to assure Florida State of its seventh win, 56-14, over the Gamecocks of South Carolina. The sweep of the Carolinas was completed the following week in front of a homecoming crowd that included many former FSU players who were on hand to honor retiring team Dr. Don Falls. The Seminoles didn't disappoint the home crowd, crushing the Catamounts of Western Carolina 50-10. Now it was time to play the team Seminole fans wanted to beat the most, the Gators. But it didn't look good in the early going. Florida jumped out to a 28-0 halftime lead. He gets the pass away in the end zone, the teal touchdown. They're kicking your butt. Offense has not scored a touchdown. Offense has not even threatened. Captain's going out. Are you scared? Don't say that. Don't answer. Don't answer. Are you scared? You scared of them yellow shirts? Them orange shirts out to scare you a little bit. Florida State came out fired up in the second half and closed the gap to 28-14 before the Gators decided the issue. He's under pressure, throws it long downfield. It's caught by Field. He's got it high step into the 25, high step into the 10. Going into the Gator Bowl against Oklahoma State, it must be remembered that the Seminoles averaged 66 points following losses this season. So if history repeats itself, look out, Cowboys. The 1986 season will begin here September 6th when Toledo comes to town. It will end November 29th with the Gators also here in Tallahassee. In between some tough road games, Miami, Nebraska, and Michigan. But the fact that 14 of 22 starters are returning and the expected emergence of a stable of red shirts 
gives Seminole fans good reason to be optimistic when looking towards 86. Tonight, untested receivers, a freshman quarterback, senior Tony Smith going out in top-notch style, 201 yards rushing. It all spelled a big victory for FSU. And our Rich Lenz was there, and he's with us live right now with all the highlights. And Rich, was it as exciting there as it was on television? Oh, Tony, this was the place to be, I'm afraid. So enjoyable, and you know, the credit for this victory has to go to coach Bobby Bowden. His team was far less experienced than OSU. He had the Hassan Jones ticket selling scandal to put behind him, and all he did was put together a superlative game plan and convince these kids, guys like Chip Ferguson, a freshman, and Herb Gaynor, Randy White, guys never caught a pass in a college game before that they could beat OSU. I talked to Tommy Bowden, Coach Bowden's son, at halftime. He told me that this afternoon, Coach Bowden came back to the hotel room, winked at Tommy and said, Tommy, how many times in a row do you think I can throw the football? Well, he threw it plenty times in a row. Let's take a look at the first half highlights right now, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. On the very first play of the game, freshman Chip Ferguson goes deep at the receiving end, sophomore Randy White. This was the first pass White has ever caught in a college game. Now, that drive small, but no matter, because the OSU kicking game was having all sorts of trouble. Two consecutive missed field goals by OSU's Joey O'Donnell. Now, the Seminoles didn't run the ball very often, but when they did, senior Tony Smith was electrifying, busting tackles and picking up key yardage. This run set up the game's first score, a 23-yard field goal by Derek Schmidt. Chip Bergson threw for 215 yards in the first half. Here's the most entertaining play of the first half, perhaps of the season for FSU. Chip Bergson into the end zone. Herb Gaynor and Demise Williams give and take, give and take, and Gaynor's got it. Six points, Florida State looks so good in slow motion. Ten zip Seminoles, and FSU's garnet and gold, loving every minute of it. But hold on, Tony Smith hurt his hand, and he was okay, though, and played a great second half. FSU closed out the first half, scoring with this 41-yard field goal by Schmidt. At the half, Bobby Bowen commented on the superlative play of his youngsters. Tough 30 minutes to go, but it would really help us. I'm really proud of the way they're playing so far. Second half, plenty of action following this OSU field goal. The Seminoles went to work. Kalidas Jones smashing three yards up the gut, 20 to three. And it gets better. Herb Gaynor, untested before tonight, proves his medal, 19 yards. This score gave the Seminoles a commanding 27 to three lead. But quicker than you can say, Stillwater, the Cowboys struck back. Thurman Thomas takes the screen pass, a couple of lead blockers, and that's all he needed. OSU's first touchdown of the night. Then more troubles. Chip Ferguson gets jammed into the Gator Bowl turf. Melvin Gillum recovers. Momentum shifts to Oklahoma State. Now, in our pregame show, we told you to watch out for Thurman Thomas's throwing arm. Here he goes. Back to QB Ronnie Williams. 12 yards, 27-17 with one minute to play in the third quarter. This fourth quarter drive belongs to senior Tony Smith. He picked up 17, 11, 11 yards. Chip Ferguson eventually scoring 34, 17, 10, 43 to play. Now one final score with 10 seconds left. Hartley Dykes scores from 31 yards out. But by that time, it was academic. The Seminoles winning it. Florida State 34, Oklahoma State 23. Tony Smith over 200 yards. Chip Ferguson, the game's MVP, 20 of 43 for 338 yards. Tony, it couldn't be any better than this if you're a Seminole fan. Well, Rich, I, I guess you can only say that uh, Toledo, the first game on the 86 schedule, has got to be worried after watching tonight. I don't know what they're going to do, looking at Chip Ferguson, knowing he's got three more years at FSU, knowing that Herb Gaynor is going to be back. Randy White, I don't know what they're going to do for an encore, but they got a few months to worry about that, Tony. Great night from the Gator Bowl. Back to you. Well, I want one more comment from you. It was Don right. Ball's last game as the, uh, as the team doctor for FSU, and he went out in fine style. He brought Tony Smith back after the injury. He sure did. Tony Smith hurt his hand a little bit. We wanted to get Doc Falls up here. He couldn't quite make it up because, frankly, he wanted to stay in the locker room. There's a little tribute to him down there, and uh, he deserves it. What a superlative career, and what a way for him to go out as well as Tony Smith. A job well done for Don Falls. I'm Tom Kirkland, Headline Sports. Before we get to a busy Detroit, get to the Gator Bowl, the Florida State Seminoles corral the Cowboys from Oklahoma State, 34-23 that final. Florida State quarterback Chip Ferguson had a big night, threw for 338 yards and two touchdowns, and ran one in for a score. 
Speaking of scores, a slew of them. Kyle hung the ball up, and I looked in there, and I just feel like I had to get it. And when I jumped up for it, he grabbed one of my arms, and I tipped it with that with my right arm, and it fell on my left hand, and I just kept my eyes on it. Uh, that pass wasn't none of me. That was all her. I threw it up there. I underthrew him a little bit, and her jumped up there and got it. So, um, you know, I owe all the credit in the world to him. In the second half, it was Fergie to Gaynor again. Freshman to sophomore for 19 yards. That made it 27 to 3. But it was time to flip the switch on Oklahoma State. This party was over. While the plan was to pass, 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 Tony Smith also ran, ran, ran for 201 yards on 24 carries. A performance that brought a huge smile to his number one fan on this night. I told the kids before the ball game, if there's one guy that I hoped had a great night, it was him. There's a guy that's been to Florida State for five years. He's worked hard. He's been in the doghouse with me. A lot of times he's not playing. Y'all y'all don't know why, and I, I won't tell you. You know, I'm quite sure he's not going to forgive me for everything that I've done, but this would, you know, ease the pressure between us, hopefully. With his wide receiver core depleted, the ticket-selling controversy, and the loss to the Florida Gators, you could measure the weight and pressure on Bobby Bowden, PSI, per square inch. Did last night's win lighten the load? No. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not under pressure at all. Yeah. Hey, the answer to that question is yes. Yeah, yeah I was, I, I really have I've been feeling the pressure. Uh, you, several guys have asked me that, which makes me think it must be noticeable. So with the Gator Bowl hardware now in hand, all Seminole eyes look towards the future, a future Bobby Bowden promises to be bright and just loaded with passes. It should be interesting. Florida State finishes at 9-3 and, and certain to rise in the final poll of the year. The Cal and when a guy comes up to block, you dive right over the top of his head. Throw, hurdle yourself into the guy with a ball. You know, do something outstanding. Do something daring. Do something dangerous. Like I said, just look, kind of peep over at Clark every now and then, see how he's covered, and kind of do like him. I think that might do the job. 60-minute football game now. Whatever happens early don't mean a thing. 60-minute football game. They score first, don't mean nothing. We score first, don't mean nothing. You play every down like it's nothing, nothing. <clears throat> I told you I want to throw that football. First play of the game. Too tight. Our tight. Pass 46. Z pump. Quarterback's going to take that football. He's going to fake that sweep. Those ends and linemen are going to block where it looks like a run. Those backs are going to make it look like a run. Then that quarterback's going to pump that ball with that safety will break on it. Then Z's going to straighten that thing out. We're going over the top to see if we can a touchdown. We're going to get a touchdown, all right? Five minutes before we come out. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> now, men, after the first down, we'll come out and throw the next down. Now, subs, don't come out of the game unless, you, don't come out of the game unless you're sure a guy's coming in for you. We can't have a mess up on the subs. On the kicking teams, don't come out unless you're positive. If you get injured, you're on the kicking team, you get injured, please go tell your substitute so, 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 he, so he'll be ready in your place next time the kicking team goes on the field. Let's have a lot of enthusiasm. Defense, defense, you win with defense, you win with defense. Attack, attack, attack. Overpower, hit them. Don't let them bring the fight to you. Defense, are you going to let that tail back? win the Heisman Trophy off of his game tonight. Is this the game that starts their tailback in the pursuit of the Heisman Trophy for next year? Don't you dare let him start it against you. You hold that guy to minimum yards. I mean, man, I want you to hit him so hard that Fisher's going to scratch his head of whether it was an unnecessary roughness. I don't want an unnecessary roughness, but I want him to scratch his head, boy, that was close. <coughs> Now, let's nail that guy. Nail him clean. But, boy, let's everybody try to get a piece of him. <clears throat> Quarterbacks, again, I mentioned to you a while ago, don't mind using your timeouts the first half. If we sit in a play and you, you, you can't understand what we're saying and you're not sure, you know, it's all right to use a timeout in that, in that case. Second half, we want to be real stingy with them. Okay, now, men, last thing I want to say is about the seniors. The seniors. I hope y'all have a great game, every one of you seniors. I hope, I can't tell you how I hope Tony Smith, I hope Tony Smith has the best game he ever had. And he might not. I mean, you don't know what's in store. But nothing I'd love to see for him and, and Cletus and Jamie and John and, and, and Isaac and Todd, uh, all you guys on defense playing your last year, offense or defense. 
I just hope you have a great game. Go out there, man, and fight your guts out here. You're on national television. Your mama's watching. She's probably up in the stands, but everybody's watching you. And you, you want to you wanna make them proud of you. And I, I, I just hope you have a great game, you know. If you don't, I ain't going to be mad at you. You know, I, I had four sons, and when they were little, I used, to, I used to spank the heck out of them. When they were bad, I wore them out. But I still loved them. I loved them, but I wore them out. And I've been on some of you guys at times. Some of you, I've been on some of you guys at times. That has nothing to do with love, does it? When you love people, you discipline them because you want to be better. Now, you get out there today, and you turn that little sweet thing loose here. I think the whole team's pulling for you. Let's have a word of prayer right quick. We'll be ready to roll. <clears throat> I think we'll be ready to roll. Uh, we'll, once, once we get through with our prayer, just uh, stay where you are until officials uh, say go, then we'll walk out there and be ready to hit it. Okay. Dear Father, thank you for letting us go to the Gator Bowl. Thank you for a good health you've given us. Lord, I'd like to pray that nobody gets hurt in this football game on either team. And we pray that you'll help us to do our best. And, oh, God, especially I'd like for you to help these seniors to go out playing the best they can play because they have been super for the Florida State program. We're here today because of them. Be with our coaches. Give them, give them and us wisdom as we try to make decisions. And uh, we just thank you what you've done for us. These things we pray in thy name. Amen. And 10 from the 22-yard line. The fake pitch. He pumps and goes deep on the first play and hits his man, Randy White, who makes the first catch of the season at the 33-yard line. Ferguson going for the end zone, looking for Gaynor. Some bumping, some shoving, and he makes the catch off the deflection for the touchdown. Hi, Coach. <laughs> hey, buddy. How Good you doing? Good to see you. Fine. Okay. All right, Al, with me, of course, Bobby Bowden. Coach, uh, you really decided to show us what kind of an arm your quarterback has, 215 yards in the first half. Well, that's good. I, I really, uh, he's a freshman, and I really wanted to see what he had. So we're going to come out and fire the football no matter what and see what he can do. Yet in many cases, the finality of the, of the drives that you had up and down the field wasn't there. Are you satisfied with the 13-0 score? No, but the penalties, we're, we look like a team that's been off for about a month. We're getting penalty, 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 and stopping ourselves a lot. I think if we can, if we can stop the penalty business, I believe we could do all right. You were scared with the youth of this team. That's what you said to me yesterday, and I haven't seen very many freshman mistakes out there. Well, that's the, that's the key to it. Uh, it would really help us next year if these kids could get a win tonight. Got a tough 30 minutes to go, but it would really help us, and I, I'm really proud of the way they're playing so far. All right, Coach. Thank you very okay, much. Buddy. Bobby Bowden. <laughs> Excuse me. quarterback y'all be sure they know what they're doing out here i mean we we know now you be sure those kids know we need to pick up on that they still getting in this face we just need the quarterback face yeah, uh -huh. you mean the, the rush yeah, is yeah, the rush yeah. well, let's get that squared away are you, are you okay on that the outside rush is good he's got a slide he didn't do a good job i got me substituted i made a big point of that thing last week that i did not want substitutes in that damn game and here we are on the first series and we got a second team center game whose idea was that no he told me not yeah, well, we, I don't want that, man. Yeah. It's a cold night. We're going to substitute on the second series because they're so dang tired. No, no don't do that. We, we, you can't get any continuity. We don't have any continuity because we keep Coach, running people in and out. I got seven minutes. Don't <laughs> you mean I got seven minutes right now? No, I say I can. You'll let me know when. I'll let you know. Okay. Oh, That's right. Don't worry about that, buddy. I just, we just got to be sure we're having a miscommunication here somehow. Yeah. Texas, if you want to run the screen. Yeah. Texas, if you want to run the screen. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right, now, what's, he's talking about, let's just hit now. Well, you know, they out physical them. You know, challenge our guys. We got them down. What are we going to do with them now? And remind them about all the stuff that's been out there saying how they've been out working us and you guys weren't taking it serious. And, they, you know, just the fact kind of pissed our players off. I know I'm not, and then we'll respond to that. Two games, Coach. 
Miami, we were up 10 points on Miami at the half, and they came back and beat us. And also against North Carolina, we stunk up the field the first half. Oklahoma State is doing the same thing, but we came back and beat North Carolina. Right. That's a good point. Now, just, just remember now, we had Miami down 10 points, didn't we, at the half? We had Miami 10 points at the half and got beat. De now, defense, don't let them have anything big. Y'all are knocking the crap out of them. You're knocking the heck out of them, defense. I'm, I'm more proud of you tonight than I've ever been. For a half. Oh, boy, I hope y'all can keep it up. I'm so dang proud of y'all. Y'all are just killing them. All I've been reading about this week is how easy Florida State's practice and how tar hard they practice and how much hungrier they were than you are and how they're going to hit you and beat you up. Hey, Coach, get the dang guys in here. I'm trying to get something together. Just have a seat there. Come on, man. We're trying to get, get everything together. <laughs> okay. A defense, if they don't score, we win the ball game, right? Let's keep it up. You, hey, defense, let's go for a shutout. Go for a shutout. National television. Last game of the year. Go for your shutout. Offense, protect your passer. I guarantee you we'll cut them to pieces if you'll let your passer throw. Men, offense and defense, stop your penalties. Offense, you'd have scored at least 10 more points the first half, except you stopped yourself. Now, men, don't get a penalty. Tell me when the officials give us five minutes. We got 30 minutes left now. Darn it, you're doing so good, I don't know what to say. Maybe I'll just shut up. Third and goal. Jones, touchdown. Every second and 10 from the 19-yard line. To throw again. For the end zone, touchdown. and keep to himself. Now this is the last play. Tony needs nine yards to break the rushing record here. All over 38. Make a good fake with that guy and pitch it. Force the pitch. We're going to try to play a chance for them to get three points for him to do that. I know that. All over 38. Yeah. 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 Yeah, coach, get your defense cranked up. Hey, you think? <laughs> how, much, how much he need? How much he need? Eight yards. We got any timeouts left? Yeah, we got. Uh, he needs, we need eight yards here? No. Yeah, we got 14 yards. Gee, we ain't gonna be on 14 yards. Oh. <laughs> hey, Chuck, who's supposed Wait, to be in there? Yes, he's in there. They haven't told him different. Huh? He different. He said first two. <laughs> they only about one's play. Well, that's our fault. That's our fault. Watch it now. Back up, man. Come on, baby, get it. and for the great hospitality that was shown us here in Jacksonville, Florida by everybody. I thought it was a great football game, and we were honored to play against a fine Oklahoma State team. Thank you. Bobby Bowie, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming.
baby. <laughs> Hold your other one up, pal. Right, right, right. Pardon? Like this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I ought to be holding him. <laughs> I ought to be holding him. Good. Good. Okay, boys. Thank you, man. Uh, very good. Okay, appreciate this, man. We did have a great time. I want you to tell your people that. Thank you, thank you, buddy. Excuse me, sorry. Wake up, coach. Thank you, boy. Thank you, sir. Hey, Gail. Hey, thank you, buddy. Thought y'all did a great job. I'm gonna tell you something. Y'all scared me to death there for about two weeks. I really couldn't. I couldn't tell whether you were getting ready or not. I but but your pride, your pride took over. Your pride took over and wouldn't let yourself down. That's a great job. I'm proud of you. <laughs> now, uh, let. This ball is the game ball that's going to go to Don Falls. Don, Don says this is his last game at Florida State, and I hope it ain't. Even if he retires, I'm going to do my best to have him out there every time we play. I know Randy would like that, too. But, Don, uh, after many, many years of great leadership that you've given us, man, I'm going to tell you something. Ten years from now, when you look back, you'll remember that guy right there more than any other individual other than your daddy. You'll remember him more than anybody else. Let's let Don say something, then we'll have us a word of prayer and go home, okay? I'm proud of all of you, man. I'm just telling you that now. Don, go ahead, you know What I'd like to do, put this in the trophy case as a memento to this great game that you guys played tonight. Uh, you can hear you, baby. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Let's have a word of prayer. Man, hey, man. All you guys that sinned last night and the night before, you're forgiven by me, all right? <laughs> you latecomers. Proud of you. Dear God, thank you for this win, and thank you for these boys. And, oh, God, I know these young men, had a, they had a chance to throw it in this season. They, they could have thrown it in after the Florida game. They could have said, well, that's it. But they had too much pride because their mamas and their daddies raised them right. And I hope this leads us on to greater things. We tied the second half of the Florida game. We outscored them 14 to 10. And I think that is the beginning of a great things that are fixing to happen to Florida State football. Well, the thing that excites me about Florida State University is that it is a relatively new school in the field of intercollegiate football and basketball there's no doubt about it when i was a kid there wasn't a florida state university football team you know there wasn't a florida state basketball team and yet as i was growing up in college i was able to compete against florida state and saw that new young school down there growing i was up in alabama but i florida state in tallahassee and i was watching them grow and uh i, I felt like you could see big time written on florida state and so being part of a university that, uh, again, all, all of us that didn't have tradition yet, but I think right now we're in the middle of it. Again, I think the fact that some people are complaining about an 8-3 season tells you something about some tradition that's being built. And, uh, but but uh, knowing, knowing also that uh, 30 or 40 years from now, I will have been on the uh, ground floor of Florida State building some great tradition. That's exciting to me. That's very exciting to me. And I hope, uh, I'm, I'm 56 years of age, and, uh, and I'm getting up to the age where you, you start, you know, people start saying, how, how many interviews can you think I've had lately where they said, how much longer can you go? <laughs> you know, well, boy, I hope I can go longer where I can contribute to Florida State. And yet I realize if we start going backwards with me, then, then we'll have to get somebody else younger to take it over. But it's exciting to me uh, trying, to, trying to build a tradition here. Now stay close to that line of scrimmage. And, hey, uh, Chip, stay low where they can't find you. Stay low where they can't find you. Chip, that's, hey, Chip, that's good. Casino, look, you can just imagine that safety back down there. He can't see you. 
You know, if I just drop back and raise up, he sees the ball up. Uh, that's all. You know where he is. You know where he is. <laughs> just, just, just stay a little bit lower where they can. That, what you did then was perfect. See? tacklers. And here he learned this one. When you square up on a guy like that, you're going to be going backwards. <laughs> that was a head snapper and a deep cleater all in one. <laughs> Even if you are toting 225 pounds on a 6-2 frame. Where would that guy come from? Second down and two, Dallas. They have never led in a ball game. Well, it was a good night to uh, open up the season for the Seminoles, I guess, Mike. Excellent night. Can't complain. I mean, you know, it wasn't the greatest game, but what the heck, huh? Yeah. Not bad. Now, you know, everything went pretty much as expected at Doe Campbell this evening. It was by no means pretty at all times, but there were plenty of bright spots. For instance, 529 yards on offense. Now, Rich Lenz is standing by live at the stadium. Rich, what's happening down there? I'll tell you the uh, truth, please. It's kind of peaceful right now. They turned all the lights off at Doe Campbell kind of by myself, but earlier there were 50,000 people here, and as you said, what they saw went pretty much according to form for a uh, opening game. The play was sloppy, plenty of turnovers, execution mediocre, but there were some bright spots. Now afterwards, Coach Bowden said the brightest spot was the defense. Of course, he gave him a shutout. The weakest point, according to Coach Bowden, was the kicking game, all aspects of it, Derek Schmidt included. Coach Bowden said they're going to have to improve that a lot if they hope to beat Nebraska next week. Now, right now, let's get back to the Toledo game. Take a look at highlights and talk about what transpired tonight. A very rough start for the U.S. Seminoles. The first three possessions resulted in turnovers. Here, Deion Sanders fumbles a punt at his own 42. Toledo recovers, but the Rockets weren't able to convert. Great defense tonight by Florida State. Now, the fullbacks played super for FSU. Best run of the night by Dean Williams, 36 yards. Superb second effort, and that gave FSU a comfortable 10-point lead. Williams turning on the depth as he heads for the paint. Now, the field was a bit sloppy, but the rain stopped in uh, clear skies in the second half. Still in the first half, another gutsy run by a similar fullback, David Palmer. Looks like he's jammed up, but he keeps fighting, finds daylight. Palmer, Williams, and Tanner Harlman were all bright spots for Florida State tonight. 17-zip FSU at the half. A shutout for the Seminole defense. Here's why A.J. Sager, pressured by Sheldon Thompson. The pass knocked down by Steve Goodbard. Coach Bowden had nothing but praise for the garnet and gold defense. Now, we showed you the best running play. Here's the second best catch. Darren Hyman leaps high. Pretty good for a guy who's just 5'7". 
Now, coming up, here is the catch of the night. A few plays later, Peter Tom Willis throws the only touchdown pass of the night. Herb Gaynor makes it happen. Beautiful touchdown right there. That made the score 24 zip. He's mighty happy, and why not? Now, speaking of highlights, here is a great one. The return of Danny McManus. This completion to Scott Demare. Danny's first completion since Auburn last fall. Way to go, Danny. All in all, Two more know. suspects have been arrested in connection with this morning's shooting death of FSU football player Pablo Lopez. One is 20-year-old FSU football player Edward Lewis Clark. The other, 21-year-old Tallahassee Community College student Lapolden Bennett. Earlier today, 20-year-old fast food employee Byron Johnson was arrested for the murder of Lopez. He's being held without bond in the Leon County Jail. Liz Compton reports on today's events. The fight that led to the death of 21-year-old Pablo Lopez began here in front of Montgomery Gym on the FSU campus. Police say the building had been evacuated during a dance because a fire alarm was set off. Hundreds of students were waiting to go back inside when Lopez showed up. At that point, a vehicle ran through the crowd at a high rate of speed. One of the uh, occupants of that vehicle was Pablo Lopez. Both Pablo and the unidentified driver exited the vehicle. Pablo uh, began or uh, got into a confrontation with uh, an individual identified as Byron Johnson. Hanley says it isn't clear what Lopez and Johnson were fighting about. At that point, Lopez left with the driver of the car, but that was not to be the end of it. About an hour later, Lopez returned and confronted Johnson in the parking lot behind Montgomery Gym. At 1.40 this morning, police alleged that Johnson pulled out a 12-gauge shotgun and fired one fatal shot into Lopez's stomach. Campus police arrested 20-year-old Byron Johnson at the scene. They recovered the shotgun and charged Johnson, who was not an FSU student, with first-degree murder. While police were on the scene, another shot rang out. Moments following the shooting, another unidentified individual fired one round from a pistol into the crowd that had gathered. The man was later identified as the driver of the car involved in the earlier incident. Liz Compton, Channel 6 Eyewitness News, Tallahassee. Clark, who is an outside linebacker with the Seminoles, has been charged with aggravated assault with a firearm and discharging a firearm in a public place. Bennett was charged with aiding and abetting. He had apparently been with Johnson when he obtained the gun that killed Lopez. Both men were released from custody on their own recognizance today. An unidentified juvenile has been charged with pulling the fire alarm that disrupted the dance and sent both suspect and victim into the parking lot. Lopez was married on Monday. He leaves not only a new bride, but many friends and teammates who will see a promising career go unfulfilled. Scott Atwell has a report. Before his death Saturday morning, Pablo Lopez was living his finest week as a Seminole. His effort last Saturday at Nebraska earned him the coach's Rambo Award for outstanding hustle and effort. But awards in football seemed woefully insignificant as word of the Lopez death spread through the player's apartment complex on Saturday. Everything just went blank and it's, it was like Pablo was a brother that died in a part of me that really got shot and I just felt deep down in my heart just a big wind just hit me. Maybe once a year I'll get a phone call uh, at 2 o'clock at night, 3 o'clock at night. Somebody's in jail, somebody's had a wreck, somebody's done this, somebody's done that, but I got the, I got the bad, I got the worst call I could get last night. Lopez had a reputation as the free spirit on the Seminole football squad. A junior criminology major from Miami, he was team leader in charge of keeping the Seminoles loose. I've never seen our players so emotional over something in my life because he was one of the most likable players on our team. If we had a most likable, he would have won it hands down. And, uh, and I don't care how hurt they are or I was, uh, nobody's hurt like the mother. Pablo was a six foot, six foot five, 275 pound friendly guy and lovable guy. They're not gonna regroup quickly over this. I don't, wouldn't expect them to and I wouldn't want them to. The Seminoles had planned a big practice on Monday. Instead, they'll hold a memorial service in honor of Pablo Lopez. Scott Atwell, Channel 6 Eyewitness News, Tallahassee. In Medard, a high school football game had to be stopped. Tackle, an all-city, all-American, destined for stardom as a Florida State Seminole. Coaches here remember Pablo Lopez as a gifted athlete who gave all for his team. Even after graduating, he would periodically drop by for a visit. And when he heard that the team needed an offensive line coach during spring practice, he volunteered. One of those coaches is William Lopez. He was always looked up to, 
and he always gave us the positive outlook that we want out of a student athlete. Assistant Principal Sam Skarnekia, a former coach, remembers a six foot four, 280 pound lineman as a gentle giant. I can't think of a person that have, would have an angry word to speak of the kid. And again, it's, it's a cliche, but it's the truth in this kid's case. He is really a super kid, and I, I'm, I'm devastated over his death. He's always doing good things for people and things like that, and it's just so hard for me to believe. Head coach Sam Miller says he doesn't know if Lopez's number will be retired from the Cobra roster. There hasn't been time to think about it's, that. It's what little incredible. time there has been has been spent wondering how. And they were playing one of those teams where, that makes you have things go wrong with you. The Seminoles knew they were in for a rough game against North Carolina, the type of rough physical teams they've had trouble with this year. It was especially the offense that had trouble, but it wasn't a Florida State team that didn't have its chances. Bob Warren has the game story from Campbell Stadium. From the get-go, Florida State's offense was in deep trouble. Carolina plays with a four-down lineman, four-linebacker setup. The Seminoles couldn't solve it. One of five quarterback sacks on the day. I don't know what I had in my mind when I came into this game. I think I was out there and, you know, I wasn't making the right decisions all day. I mean, I had people open, and uh, a few times I should have gotten rid of the ball when I did get sacked, you know, which was my fault. And, um, you know, it might look like it was the Lions' fault, but it was my fault. I had people open, and I wasn't getting the ball to them. The Tar Heels had averaged an amazing 341 yards rushing the first two games. Games. This afternoon, they went on top to break the seal late in the first quarter. Jonathan Hall hit his fullback, James Thompson, who busted a tackle and roared down to the FSU 15. Three plays later, it was Hall to a wide-open Eric Streeter, 15 yards out and into the promised land for a 7-0 lead. Florida State had a couple of chances to get on the board, but troubled Derek Schmidt left his toe in the locker room. As it turns out, it's more than that. I got a muscle spasm on my back. I, I got a Thursday night, just woke up the next morning, and I had a pain on the left side of my back. Out in pregame, uh, I was kicking, and it, it caught me. It turned into a, a pretty bad spasm. Schmidt's pain was nothing compared to that of North Carolina head coach Dick Crumbs. He was the most severely injured person in the game, suffering torn ligaments in his knee after accidentally being hit by a Florida State player on the sidelines. But the pain was eased somewhat with the knowledge that his club had shut the FSU vaunted offense down cold and led at halftime 7 to nothing. In the second half, the Seminoles' defense got nasty. Gerald Nichols smashed Carolina quarterback Mark May to the ground at the 1, and the heels were in dire straits. They lined up to punt, but Lee Miller had only inches in which to operate. Felton Hayes busted through the line, got a big mitt on the ball, and knocked it out of the end zone for a safety. The Seminoles were back in it at 7-2, and so was the wired crowd. Two possessions later, they really went nuts. When Peter Tom Willis, then for Chip Ferguson, launched a wobbler towards the end zone, Ronald Lewis jumped as high as he can go and robbed the thing from the Carolina defenders. The freshman-to-freshman -freshman combination good for 28 yards. FSU was on top for the first time in the game at 8-7. The Tribe then went for two. It worked to perfection. Willis to Herb Gaynor. It was 10-7. Carolina refused to fold. They marched back and tied it at 10 apiece early in the fourth quarter when Lee Guiarmas nailed his 25-yarder. Then, with only 105 left to play, opportunity flashed its pearly whites for the Seminoles. Mark May fumbled. The ball got to bounce it around, and by the time Gerald Nichols pounced on it, it had rolled down to the 27-yard line. The Seminoles were golden. Or were they? Three plays later, with the ball dead center in the middle of the field, it was Derek Schmidt's game to win or lose. It is wide to the left. But the game settled nothing. It ended in a 10-10 tie. Florida State is now 1-1-1 one, one one with Michigan to come. This is Bob Warren, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports at Doe Campbell Stadium. Florida a and right the death of Pablo Lopez. He was shot on their campus last week. They had a tough time today. First quarter, North Carolina has the ball. Jonathan Hall finds Eric Streeter for the touchdown. 7-0 North Carolina. Talk about tough days. North Carolina head coach Dick Crum got hit during a play on the sideline, suffered knee damage, later returned in the second half when he was on crutches. And when he got back, he didn't want to see this. Third quarter, Kenny Miller's punt blocked by Felton Hayes. Florida State gets the safety as it goes out 7-2. Then the Seminoles went to work. Peter Todd Willis puts it up. Ronald Lewis makes the catch for the touchdown. That made it 8-7 to seven FSU. On the extra point, Willis wanted the pass, and he wanted to go to Herb Gaynor. Here he is over in the corner. Two-point conversion is good, 10-7 Florida State. And early in the fourth quarter, Lee Glarmus hits a 23-yard field goal. Game's tied at 10. It's good. We have a 10-10.
Eight seconds left now. Seminole place kicker Derek Smith misses from 36 yards. It is that game ends in a 10-10 tie. So we did better than we did against Nebraska, but uh, that's not good enough. You know, we, it, 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 we just got... We've got a lot of work to do there, man. One-one-and-one record and 50 cents will get you a cup of coffee and no respect. That's where Florida State finds themselves heading into Saturday's game at Michigan at the height of mediocrity after tying North Carolina over the weekend. Florida A&M is also suffering those Monday after blues. They are one and two, but their loss to Temple didn't hurt nearly as badly since they were heavy underdogs. Don Evans now recaps some of the weekend's problems. It was an outcome, frankly, that a lot of people thought might occur, but not in the way it did. Derek Schmidt's missed field goal would have beaten North Carolina and overcome a bad performance by a patched-up offensive line, one that saw them give up five sacks, just too many problems to deal with. We just have not been able to get, because of injury or because of uh, death, uh, the, 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 the five, any coordination that we want yet. The Seminoles did play great on defense Saturday. Deion Sanders, two interceptions and great punt returns the highlights but they were not at all sharp offensively it leaves a lot of things unfulfilled heading into Saturday's Michigan game yes it is still a team with potential and if once we could start tying it together and piecing it together and quit making mistakes which uh, we're, we're making for a while uh, we just gotta hope our defense can play good enough we, we should have won the ball game Saturday in my opinion Florida a and You can expect still another big crowd in Ann Arbor. Last Saturday, quarterback Jim Harbaugh threw for two TTE, two Ds, and ran for another in an easy win over Oregon State. But still, the ever-demanding head coach, Bo Schembechler, isn't completely satisfied. We have got to get better in all phases of the game. I don't think we played as well offensively because we made too many mistakes. Uh, our defense, once again, was on the field too much, uh, allowed too much uh, possession time. Uh, they've been hurt physically. They've lost uh, four or five top kids now, and and uh, that's hurt the defense some. Florida State is 1-1-1 one, one, and one after a disappointing 10-10 tie with North Carolina and Tallahassee last Saturday. Still, the defense performed well, which is a plus for Bobby Bowden entering a very tough road contest at Ann Arbor. Bo Schembechler has probably got one of the best programs in the United States of America. They're just plain good, and they're always going to be plain good and you're not going to catch Michigan any other way. And if you don't want to play them when they're good, you better not schedule them, because they're always going to be good. Well, the Washington Huskies have done a pretty fair job. The now porous steel curtain served as a wake-up tonic for the Vikings' previously dormant offense. This beautifully thrown bomb to number 84, Hassan Jones, was negated due to a penalty. Tommy Kramer gave the rookie plenty of chances to excel. All told, the fifth round draft pick from Florida State caught a half dozen passes for 140 yards and two touchdowns as the Vikes rolled up 400 plus yards against the nearly invisible Steeler defense. A little iffy there early on, but of course it's a 60-minute ball game. That's what you have to remember. Knocked down early, the Florida State Seminoles kept their cool today and came back to beat South Carolina. Gamecocks freshman quarterback Todd Ellis had things pretty much his way in the first half. Right here, he's going to go up top to Ryan Bethay. Take a look at the play. Wrestles the ball away from Martin Mayhew. What a catch, and the Gamecocks lead it. 14 to 3. Now Peter Tom Willis started at quarterback for the try, but he was knocked out of the game early. So on comes Chip Ferguson playing in front of his home state fans. And the Fergie to Floyd show is about to get started. Chip fires to Victor Floyd, who makes the one hand grab 30 yards. The first of Floyd's four touchdowns on the day. He had 115 yards rushing. FSU trailed at the half 21-13, but they reeled off 32 points after intermission. Here's the opening kick of the second half. Keith Ross took it at the one. Watch him bust through right there. Hey, I'm still going. He's going to take it all the way down to the 49-yard line, and that will set Florida State in business. Easy pickings from there. Five plays later, Floyd takes it in. From eight yards out, two points needed to tie the game right here. So Chip finds Pat Carter in the end zone. It's 21-21. Now, by now, the FSU defense has figured out this run-and-shoot attack of South Carolina. Ellis had zero passing yardage in the third quarter. This interception set up a 7-0 score for Dane Williams. He'll take it over from the one. FSU leads 35-21. Now, following an Ellis fumble, Seminoles again knocking at the door. Dane Williams... Chalking up his second TD. This one from eight yards. Seminoles big 45-28 winner. 
Early third quarter, Columbia, South Carolina. Todd Ellis drops back the throw. He's under pressure from Brett Jones. It's intercepted by Bart Schutz, and the defensive tackle returns the ball and sets up the Seminoles for another score. Lansing, Michigan, Coach Bowden, and I guess that's what Michigan autumn afternoons are all about. And uh, the stadium was packed 76,000 plus. Florida but State it, University, uh, the head coach in those years, Bill Peterson, and the defensive coach, Bob Harbison. Nice to have you both with us tonight. Great to be here again. Yeah, good to see you again. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit. We're going to start with the 64 season. We'll get to the 67 season in a little bit. But let's start with 64 because in a couple minutes, folks will be seeing those great highlights. Mm -hmm. Uh, it will be remembered, uh, I suppose, largely because of the first win over Florida. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But, I, you know, in, in the overall look at college football, the most significant thing that happened in that season was not the win over Florida. It was the beginning of a, a new attack in college football. You brought the pro passing game, literally, to college football. Talk about that a little bit. Where'd it come from? Well, Gary, really, what it, well, how it came about was... a. When I came here for an interview for the job, I didn't get to look at the facilities and even at the location. I'd never been to Florida before, and I flew in here and took the job. And and uh, where were you I, flying from? I flew in from uh, LSU, Baton LSU, Rouge. Uh -huh. I was coaching at LSU, and so I didn't get a chance to look at the location or the the facilities. And it, and Bob can tell you, the facilities were terrible. It was positively the worst that there was in the whole college football. And uh, then I got here and looked at the map and found out on the west was the Gulf of Mexico and, and uh, Jacksonville was the closest big town and there wasn't any roads into Tallahassee. So, <laughs> so we decided that we had to start the passing game. Well, we started the first year. We had two flankers out there, but we didn't have the personnel to run it. But we uh, thought as a coaching staff that we would continue to build with it and work on defense. And when we finally got the right people, and then that's when we got Tensi and Blitnikoff then we had it we had it made and of course uh, we, we were very simple in the passing game we had five basic patterns and from those five basic patterns we could run anything you know from them and uh, so uh, that that's how it come come about now I, we did visit a lot of pro camps too although in the pro camps we're not throwing the ball at that time uh, they it was uh, uh, the was prince Sid Gilman uh, uh, contributed a whole lot to to our thinking you know although they were in the pros are so complicated they have so many pass cuts that w and we had to narrow it down to five and they mirrored each other and uh, so that's that's what we did and our kids learned how to do it well uh, bob is a defensive coach how in the world did you ever get a defense ready for something they really had never seen before in order to just let the offense practice well that's a good question we uh, we worked uh on different uh, things and uh, also while they were learning what to do on offense we were learning what to do on defense from professional people too mm -hmm. you know so we used some of their ideas in there and uh, we were able to come out with uh, some pretty good stuff there I think the thing that Bob really did best on defense that, uh, that helped us and when we run into somebody after the start was a pass rush we could we could get a good, great pass rush, mm -hmm. and nobody else did because they never worked against us, you mm -hmm. know, and that was one of the things he worked on hard. Actually, so everybody else when, you, when you break down getting ready for the other teams, you know, uh, uh, we never saw the offensive team at the spring practice and stuff like that. Oh, so, really? It was a uh, so we had our own scout teams that would be the opponents, you know, so we wouldn't be actually working with them, you know. That and that's where your practices are broke up. Mm -hmm. Coach, it was also the, really the first year of, of free substitutions, wasn't it? 64? Well, that changed back and forth. Uh, Blitnikoff, when, uh, I, I, I think 64 was free substitution, but uh, uh, there was one year there where you could only go in, the, in, in a quarter one time. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what year that was. Well, I don't know, but that year we had offensive and defensive teams like yeah. they do now, I know. Yeah. But that was the first time that really happened. I'm not positive, but I, mm -hmm. it was close to it. Yeah. 
Yeah, because where would you where would you put Tennessee on defense? Well, you you had a. Yeah, I think there was because I think the year before Blitnikoff ran was uh, playing uh, against Miami. I happened to be looking at that today and run a intercepted a pass and run back for a score. Blitnikoff was a defensive back. He was, he was a defensive playing defensive back, back the year yeah. before. And we beat Miami at that time. Yeah. Coach, what 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 was when you first saw Blitnikoff? Uh, Blitnikoff, did you realize that this was somebody who was who had a gift that wasn't just going to stop there? Gary, that's a funny, in, uh, interesting story. A guy by the name of Ken Miller, who was head of the physical education department at Florida State University, came to me and said, "There's a guy up in Erie, Pennsylvania, that his one of the guys he coached and track says this guy's a great." a great football player so we sent up and got film and in one film he was a halfback when he came here he run for seven touchdowns in high school uh, as a halfback and we got here we saw what great hands he had and we're trying to find that combination that i was talking about with the right two or three people that we can make our passing game go and so we we moved him out to receivers and uh Look receivers. You started yeah <laughs> and uh and, of course, he was a great one, you know, just a positively a great football player. I remember the time that we put him in against Georgia Tech, and he had been hurt. And I called him in, and I said, now, Fred, you can redshirt or you can play if we get a chance to play. He said, I want to play. So we were up in about the last third quarter of, a, of the Georgia Tech. I put him in, and it tends to hit him for 75 yards and a touchdown, and Georgia Tech tied us. I mean, we were ahead 14-7, to 7, Georgia Tech tied us. <laughs> And so uh, it, it, he, he, he just was a natural. He really was not great speed, but great quickness in his final move. And he could, he could find the opening. You know, he move away from those linebackers. And back in those days, it was really uh, uh, the uh, uh, zone defenses. You were mm -hmm. getting mostly zone defenses. And the other thing that we did in the passing game that even the pros were not doing at that time, because I remember Vince Lombardi took it from us. Uh, he, he and Bob were great friends, but uh, I spoke at a clinic up in... Uh, Atlantic City and I talked about the hot receiver and Vince spent uh, three or four hours with me about the hot receiver. What's so the hot receiver? Hot receiver was anybody going vertically up the field uh, that would if the linebacker came we popped it off to him and that's the first thing we looked we had a key for it and we'd we'd hug. And then if that situation didn't happen you just you'd looked off go the way. Regular, you had, uh, regular route. So you had a you had a regular route but you yeah. had a hot receiver. Yeah we had somebody go going up. vertically it might be a halfback might be a tight end uh, you know, <laughs> so uh, that that was the thing, and really and truly, uh, the pros were not doing that at that time, and we put that. In, in, and of course, now the pros have it all together, and they still oh, call yeah. it the hot receiver. To, to, yeah. to this day, yeah. Coach, what do you remember about '64? I mean, the win over Florida had to be one of the highlights, the Gator Bowl victory. What what's in your mind? Well, I, oh, I think the uh, first win over Florida there, but there there's so many things. Uh, probably. Uh, uh, you know, we uh, we had a really good defensive team. I mean, and we were going along in, in, in Kentucky, playing Kentucky. Yeah, I think it was about the third or fourth ball game there. It was called the Magnificent Seven? Right. right. And, uh, they all shaved their heads? Right. Yeah. And uh, in that game there, we haven't given up a point up to that time in there. And, and uh, I told them, well, if, if they didn't let them score in that ball game, why, they could shave my head. <laughs> and uh, I was starting to sweat in the third quarter, and I put the second team in, and the guy fumbled a punt. And uh, Kentucky recovered, and they scored. And uh, they, uh, I remember George L. Sandler, some of them, they were ready to kill me after that. But there were a lot of interesting things with yeah. this team. It was, uh, it was really a lot of really fun through there, you know. And uh, then the next week, we uh, go up to Georgia and beat them, and, you know, this is pretty big time. I mean, now in Tallahassee, where you beat two SEC schools no, in the old like that, the you know. You don't do that yeah. now. And, uh, That's one distinction we still have, Bob. We beat Florida, Georgia four times in a row. <laughs> well, it's hard to beat them when you can't you play them. Georgia and Florida the two years back-to-back? -back? Not the two it years, wasn't, but it wasn't no, back to back. back to back. But you so, beat them yeah. four times in a row. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing that Bob brought up, though, the kid that fumbled that punt, it was a fumble punt that... Uh, Bob sent in a, a, a second stringer, <laughs> see, and the guy fumbled it, and he wouldn't go in the dressing room, and uh, he was crying. And I said, Pat Conway, what's the matter with you? He said, they'll kill me if I go in there. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I said, no, we, we win together, we lose together, you know. And uh, 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 this didn't cause it, but Pat Conway became an attorney. And then uh, they tell me that I, that he committed suicide. And, uh, he was really a lot of people, uh, very successful from that, uh, Jimmy Nash's from 
uh, studio George up really? here was now President of Solomon Brothers in yeah, New York. Yeah, he was on that. He was, yeah. he was our defense chief. Uh, Captain. Back there, uh -huh. and uh, we had, you know, uh, uh, there was a lot of other good coaches uh, on the Don team there, too. There was a guy named Bowden was coaching then, you yeah. know. Bowden. Little Bobby Bowden. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was little Bobby. He was uh, coaching. Bowden was and coaching, and he was yeah, coaching receivers. He had a good staff. And, uh, had a lot of fun. Had yeah. a great, great staff. Don James, that coaches Washington, was, uh, was on the defensive staff. The guy still knows how to pass, huh? Yeah. I mean, that's a big part yeah. of his game. Yeah. All right, let me ask quickly, Coach, because we only got about a minute left before we look at some of the highlights of 64. Those five CDs in the Gator Bowl still a record. Yeah, still uh, a record. That must have been quite a thrill. It was a quite a thrill. I, well, I think the, the one time that we really didn't make any mistakes, we had uh, we, we did lose Murdoch, who was our kicker, and we had to we went for the two points. We didn't make two points very mm -hmm. often, but uh, it was a perfect ball game. It really was. They, 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 they had Tensky and Blittenkoff and, and Floyd, and, and boy, they were just catching everything and we had put in some new stuff and all of it clicked you know well, we're going to see some of it now uh, and when we finish out a look at this season we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, the 67 season well 1964 was a, it was a great year for florida state football we talked about the magnificent seven on defense you know we think shaving our heads now is is in vogue those guys are doing it way back <laughs> those guys brought that to the game uh, enjoy the 64 season when we come back we'll talk about 64. <laughs> State opened the 1964 season at the Orange Bowl in Miami against coach Charlie Chase Hurricane. Shortly after the opening kickoff, Miami's Pete Banazak went off tackle. But he fumbled and Max Wetstein of Leesburg, Florida recovered for the Seminole. Big Steve Tensey, six feet five at quarterback. And he passes deep to his favorite target, Fred Bolitnikoff. It's completed. The play carries 49 yards for the Miami 12. The fumble stalled the advance. But FSU came back minutes later. And on this occasion, it was Tensy to bullet the cop for a 27-yard gainer to the Hurricane 22. And in three more plays, the Seminoles had the first of many touchdowns for the season. A 15-yard scoring play from Steve to Fred. Tensy to bullet the cop. Les Murdoch's extra point put seven on the board for Florida State. In the second period, it was junior quarterback Ed Pritchett of Decatur, Georgia in action for Florida State. He rolls to the right. He finds Bolitnikoff on the sideline for 11 yards for the Miami 37. And Pritchett goes to the air again. Again, it's to Bolitnikoff. This one for 16 yards for the Miami 21. No point in turning from a winning combination. Pritchett rolls out. Then he cuts over to the right and throws to Bolitnikov. Good for eight yards to the 13. And the FSU aerial attack continues. Pritchett going this time to Bill Dawson. The big redhead from Valdosta, Georgia, picks up six yards on the first down at the seven. Miami set the Seminoles back a few yards, but Coach Bill Peterson sent Steve Tensey in. No secret, he's going to throw, and it's to Bolitnikov, who scores on a 15-yard play. Murdoch added the point. Florida State had a 14 to nothing victory over Miami. A highly rated Kentucky team with straight victories over Ole Miss and Auburn next on the schedule. FSU relishes that underdog role. That's Larry Green and the old Statue of Liberty. 15 yards to the Kentucky 32. Now it's quarterback Steve Tensey in action. Passing to end Don Floyd for 14 yards, the first down to the 16. Six plays later, the Seminoles on the four. Tensey aiming here for fullback Lee Naramore for six points. Les Murdoch's conversion gave FSU a 7 to nothing lead in the first five minutes. And only the beginning. Look at this one from Tensey to Bolitnikov. 53 yards. And Florida State 14, Kentucky nothing. Sun Wildcats just couldn't recover. Here's quarterback Ed Pritchett back to kick for FSU. His punt to Roger Bird bounces away from the Kentucky halfback. And George D'Alessandro, a junior from Fort Myers, recovers for Florida State of the 13. The 64-yard kick set up the next touchdown. 
B.D. Phil's corner goes into action here. He goes up the middle for eight yards to the four. And four plays later, it's Spooner again. At this time, he goes off tackle for the touchdown. Florida State 21, Kentucky nothing. A minute remaining in the first quarter. Midway through the second period, a pass interception plus an interference call gave Kentucky a first down at the 12. The Wildcats move to the two, but Roger Bird hit hard by Bill McDowell, Avery Sumner recovering the fumble. Three minutes later, Florida State knocking again. They didn't wait for the answer. It was Phil Spooner inviting himself in for the fourth touchdown to give Florida State a 47 nothing lead. Florida State left the field at halftime with that margin. And the Seminoles are ready to continue after the intermission. A tenthy to Belichnikoff pass resulting in a touchdown. The fifth of the season for this pair, 34 to nothing. A change of goals in the final period made no difference. Wayne Giardino carried into the end zone for touchdown number six. Murdoch's kick made at FSU 41, Kentucky nothing. Midway through the final period, FSU completing its scoring for the day. Pritchett throwing to Belichnikoff. He sets the ball up at the six. And on the following play, Pritchett rolls out and keeps. Circling left end, the Gwynn standing up. FSU in front, 48 to nothing. It just wasn't supposed to happen. The Seminoles going on to defeat Kentucky, 48 to six. Next stop for FSU, Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia. The hometown Bulldogs not in a friendly mood. In fact, they faced the Seminoles downfield in the first quarter to the 24. And catching the Florida State defenders off balance, Lynn Hughes passes to Pat Hudson. He makes the catch and gets down to the three. But a hard tackle by Howard Eeler jars the ball loose. Bill McDowell recovers for Florida State at the three. Florida State now in possession at the three. And the partisan crowd gets a look at the FSU running game. Steve Tensey gives off to Phil Spooner. Phil shows his heels to the Bulldogs with this 40-yard gallop. Joe Bersenel finally brings him down at the FSU 43. A first down and the Seminoles have room to move. Two plays later, Tensey calling the plays for Florida State with a flat pass to the left to end John Floyd. He heads down the sideline for a long 50-yard run. Joe Burson hits him, slides off, and Jerry Bernardo drives him out of bounds at the four. Florida State has moved 94 yards in three plays. Four plays later, the Seminoles hadn't scored, but Les Murdoch just took care of that with a field goal, a three to nothing lead over Jordan. Tensey and Bolitnikoff had quite a day of tossing and catching the football. Tensey completed 14 of 24 for 193 yards. Bolitnikoff caught eight for 114, including this one that picked up 11 yards to the FSU 37. And that shows the moves, or some of the moves, that this boy Bolitnikoff has. At the end of the first period, Florida State three, Georgia nothing. In the second quarter, with a score of the same, Pritchett kicking for FSU from the Georgia 47. Doug McFaul waiting for the ball. He's hit by it. The ever alert Bill McDowell recovers for Florida State at the 16. It took three plays to move down to the one yard line, and then it was fullback Lee Narimore going over for the touchdown. Tenth point then came on Murdoch's place. But the Bulldogs still had some bite. They drove downfield in a sustained march to set the ball at the two, and on a third down play, quarterback Preston Weidelhuber scored. Bob Petter's kick was good. It was FSU 10, Georgia 7 at the end of the first half. Moving into the third quarter, FSU with a three-point lead over Georgia. Florida State defense keeping the pressure on. Hughes back to pass. He's trapped by the yard-rushing FSU line for a loss of five yards. Since Dooley's Bulldogs determined, driving to the six on third down, Fred Barber goes in for the touchdown. Bob Etter's point after gave Georgia a 14 to 10 lead. Trailing for the first time in the year, the Seminoles came to life. Starting from their own 21, they moved to the Georgia 20. Five minutes remaining in the ball game.
Dan Tensey's in at quarterback. He fades back to throw. Spot for Litnikoff, who cuts over from the right, snags the ball at the five, and plunges over the goal line for the touchdown. Now repeat on that same play, showing the pattern run by the FSU flanker. He makes it look so easy. Les Murdoch's kick gave FSU a 17 to 14 lead over Georgia. When the game ended a few minutes later, the Seminoles were still unbeaten and untied. A passionate crowd of more than 42,000 fans jammed into Bill Campbell Stadium for the Florida-Florida State game. This is the first time the Gators have played the Seminoles in Tallahassee. Chances looked slim for that victory when Florida recovered an early fumble and Larry Dupree carried to the one. But then on fourth and one, the FSU line gets stubborn. Tom Shannon fumbles. George D'Alessandro recovers for FSU. The first threat of the game has been checked. Florida was back again a few plays later, but quarterback Steve Sparia runs into hard-charging middle guard Jack Shinolta. He's dropped for a yard loss. Shinolta made AP lineman of the week after this game. A scoreless first quarter. Early in the second period, Florida moved down to midfield, and Sparia rolling out fumbles. Howard Eeler recovers for Florida State at the 45. And with room to operate, FSU then unloads with the bomb. It's Tensi to Belitnikoff on this one coming up. On this one, Fred evaded the defender at the line of scrimmage. Then he outraced the deep man to get into the clear. Look at that faking by Tensi before he spots the man Bolitnikov and hits him. And now another look at the same play from field angle. There's Tensi back there at quarterback. Fades back, looks to the left, and then throws to the right. And here's Bolitnikov to take it. That brings in Les Murdoch for the placement try. It's up and good. Florida State 7, Florida nothing. That took care of the scoring for the first two periods, FSU leading 7 to nothing at halftime. At the start of the third quarter, Les Murdoch kicking off for Florida State. He booms one away down to the Florida 12. Marcus Baszler under it. He returns at 22 yards, then fumbles, and George D'Alessandro, the alert Seminole, to land on the ball. FSU in possession now at the Gator 34. And the Seminoles fired up again. Can't see the quarterback. He gives to Phil Spooner on the draw. A big gap at center, and it's good for 10 yards to the 24. On third and four, Tensey passing here completes the Floyd. A first down at the Florida 13. Seven yard gain was then nullified by a penalty. And on second and 15, Sensi passing to Floyd again, complete to the Florida seven. Spooner missed the first down, and on fourth and three, Murdoch called upon the boot one. He does from 24 yards out, FSU taking a 10 to nothing lead over Florida. And that was the score as the third period ended. In the final period, FSU ball at the 45. Hensi at quarterback, he gets it now and spots Don Floyd, gets him for 19 yards. Floyd caught seven for 85 against the Gators. The FSU running attack was also clicking. Wayne Giardino, a sophomore, a fine running sophomore too, gets the handoff here and goes for 13 yards before he can be brought under control. He got gained eight more than before Les Murdoch went after his second field goal try. His eighth of the year. Good from 34 yards out. A 13 to nothing lead for Florida State. Florida then came to life with Steve Spurrier's passing. This one to Jack Harper carries for 35 yards. The first down at the Seminole six. On the next play, it's Harper who rams into the end zone for the touchdown. Jim Hall's placement was good and it was Florida State 13, Florida 7. 
Then the Gators tried an onside kickoff, but FSU recovered. On second down, Tensey passing to Floyd. Completed for 27 yards and a first down at the Florida 21. Three plays failed to advance the ball. And then on fourth and 10, Murdoch called upon again for a 40-yard kicking effort. He makes it number three of the game. It gives him 49 points for the year. FSU 16, Florida 7. Less than seven minutes remaining in the game. Now Florida trying to score late in the game. On fourth and nine at the FSU 48, Sporia back to throw, but he's rushed by the hard-charging Seminole line led by Schinholzer. As a result, this off-balance pass is intercepted by Bill McDowell at the 38. He returns to the Florida 33 before he's stopped. The game ended two minutes later. A cherished first victory over Florida, 16 to seven, an eight one one season, and a Gator Bowl invitation to play Oklahoma. Dr. Bob Johnson here tonight with Doug Mannheimer, and we're here to remind you about WFSU TV. I'm sure that every one of you that are watching this great football spectacular enjoying seeing some of the glory years of Florida State. The days when Florida State was just really getting on the map football wise. And to see Coach Bill Peterson and Bob Harbison here is just a real thrill and brings back a whole lot of memories to me. But remember why we're here, primarily because. FSU needs your help. Quality television is telev television worth paying for. So we want you to be sure and call 487-3200. Right now, make the phones ring. We're all volunteers here tonight. The telephone operators, Doug and myself, the camera people, we're here because we know what quality television means. We want television of this caliber to stay in Tallahassee. WFSU TV, 487-3200. Or if you're out of town, Call us on the 800 line, 322-WFSU. Doug, you had a lot to do with putting this uh, show together. Uh, it's really a great one. We're just getting started. Well, thanks, Bob. You know, public television is really the sort of thing that allows this. Uh, I grew up in Tallahassee. My dad took me to the first game when I was three. And uh, so I've, I've always enjoyed Florida State football. We knew that we were not preserving the history of a great sport here in Tallahassee as much as we could. And so we decided we'd try to come up with a way to preserve a lot of football at Florida State. So WFSU has cooperated with us to convert all the films in Florida State's football history to video. We've done that, and what you see tonight is the beginning of that. But I guess that says something for public television, the fact that somebody could just have an idea, and public television takes it and makes it happen. You ought to join with us. If you enjoy Florida State football, if you enjoy sport, if you enjoy Florida State University, it's time for you to say, I'd like to be a part of this. 904-487-3200 or 800-322-WFSU. Your money helps enable programming like this so that WFSU can preserve the history of Florida State football. Doc, you were a part of that. I think in 64, you were yep. the team physician. That's right, 62 through the 65 season. and. Uh, let me tell you, it's, it's just a thrill to see Bill and, and Bob here tonight. We worked uh, very closely together back in those years. And I'd like to say this about Bill Peterson. No matter what you say, Bill was a character, Bill was a coach. And everything we have at Florida State today in football, I really believe goes back to the good foundation that Bill Peterson laid with his pro offense. And uh, you know, I, the, the stories about Bill are just, just never cease. Uh, I remember one, he, you know, as I look at him tonight, sitting over there, he's still a good looking gentleman, very dignified, very prestigious. <clears throat> and I remember going with a football team up to uh, play Auburn one year. 
And we used to stay in a place called the Black Angus Inn, which was on the big tra traffic circle as you're coming into Col Columbus from the south. And we stayed in the motel, and the restaurant was on the other side of the traffic circle. So we always wondered how many players we'd lose going from the motel to the restaurant. But anyway, we got there early uh, one, half, one Friday afternoon, and uh, the football players went into their room to have their steak dinners, and the owner invited us into uh, a little private room, the staff and the coaches. And on the walls were emblazoned with co pictures of great football players and great coaches. And they were all uh, personal little messages written on them at all. And I was sitting next to uh, Coach Peterson, and he nudged me, and he says, Doc, the next time he comes in, ask him why my picture's not up there. <laughs> and I says, gosh, Coach, I can't do that. And he says, do it, do it. So the next time he came in, I said, uh, you know, I, I look around here, and I said, I really don't see Coach Peterson's picture anywhere. <clears throat> and he looked and never cracked a smile, never hesitated, said, Doc, you're not going to believe this, but I must have had 10 pictures up here, and the women keep stealing them. <laughs> and I don't know whether Bill believed it, but he sure had a big smile across his face. <laughs> Bill brought a lot of smiles. I, I, one of the lines that I liked best, I think it was in the next film you're going to see in just a second out at uh, Texas A&M, Seminoles were down at half. It had been raining. Pete brought the team out there on an old uh, Eastern Electra, and the team was down. Pete was a little fired up, and he said, "Gentlemen, we didn't you bring we didn't bring you out here on a four-plane engine to be playing like that. That's we right. got to get out there and fill those footballs with air." Seminoles yeah. did that too. We need you to help fill some coffers here, though, at WFSU Television. If you like this sort of broadcasting, if you'd like to have WFSU do some uh, additional projects with Florida State Sports. We hope you'll call in. Tell us about it. Tell these folks who come out tonight to give their time to help WFSU Television continue to do these things. There's something that, uh, well, what did they do with the tape? Here it is, hold on. The camera people hate that when you move around. Bobby Bowden, Finding a Way. Many of you recall this video from a couple of years ago. Gary Jordan produced this video. It's a whole season of Bobby Bowden. It was funded by WFSU Television. Your contributions enable WFSU to do this. Now, in return, and this is sort of public broadcasting, we give back to you for your $120 pledge, $10 a month for broadcasting and television that you can be proud of. This is uh, one of our premiums, Bobby Bowden finding a way. You can put it in your VCR and relive the Bowden moments. We will have that a little later on in our program, but. Uh, We've got some great footage coming up of uh, Steve Tensey. Well, we've, we've seen Tensey. That's I guess right. we, go to, we go to Hammond right. and Sellers. Right. 1967, you'll see the great game uh, at Legion Field, 37 to 37 with Bear Bryant. And I think Bear sort of uh, became introduced to Florida State football, didn't he, Doc? He really did. He really did. In fact, his classic statement was, what the hell's going on out there? And that, that was a great game. We've got a challenge, uh, Doug. A contractor called and is challenging all the contractors who happen to be watching tonight. He has uh, contributed $50, and he is challenging all the other contractors to do at least the same. This is Homeowner's Helper. So all of you contractors out there, why, come on, get on the phone, 487-3200. Or if you're out of our immediate area, call the 800 number at 322-WFSU-TV. You know, Florida State is known for so many things. Football is only part of it. Football is only part of what we're known for. We're now becoming extremely well known for WFSU TV and the quality of television that you see on this station. Tonight, this great football program. Uh, last night, the beautiful, beautiful program, I hope you saw, the salute to public television. A week ago, the Boston Pops with Perry Como. Uh, to quote an old cliche, it doesn't get much better than that. It really doesn't. So call us now, 487-3200. We're going back to FSU football and Coach Pete and Coach Harbison and Gary shortly. But uh, right now, call us while you can because we'll hold it up. You just have to watch us for a few more minutes, and then we'll be back to FSU football. Right, Doug? Well, that's right. And, folks, if you really like this type of broadcasting, if you like to see WFSU uh, look at its entire university, call us. Let us know because some folks think maybe we shouldn't have this type of broadcasting. The people here at WFSU are very responsive. They're re responsive to what you'd like to see. It's, it's a week before a certain Saturday night in the Orange Bowl in, uh, in Miami. Florida State will start its season again. 487-3200 or 
322-WFSU. Call us now. Let these folks know. Kurt Unglob here is a former Florida State player. He's ready to take your call and let, let, uh, let Kurt know if you think it's good for Florida State and WFSU to work together on programs like this. We think it's going to be a lot of fun. Coming up, we've got Coach Bill Peterson, the father of passing in college football. Bob Harbison, one of the greatest defensive coaches uh, ever in college no football. Question. Gary Jordan was going to talk to them about 1967, a great, great year. I think that was the first year that Florida State defeated the University of Florida in Gainesville. You'll see footage of uh, Kim Hammond on his uh, uh, famous uh, game where he was knocked out early in the first judge quarter. Judge Hammond. That's, I've got to remember that. You as that. a lawyer, you well, certainly shouldn't forget that's that right. he was a judge. Circuit judge. Court Judge Kim that's Hammond right. from Volusia County, that's Hall right. of Fame member. He's, uh, he's with us tonight by way of film, uh, and we'll see the film where Ron Sellers comes back and breaks the Seminoles back when they were down and Hammond was hurt. This is the sort of thing that public television can bring you. You can't find it anywhere else. But we hope you'll call us, 800-322-WFSU. Gary Jordan and uh, Coach Bill Peterson will be along to tell you a little bit about that season. If you like this, please let us know, 487-3200. It's uh, football and WFSU night, Bob. That's right, that's right, and it's a great night, great program. Now we're going back to Gary Jordan, Coach Bob Harbison, and former head football coach Bill... Um, Peterson. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Bob. Now, I don't know if a lot of you folks know that Bob Johnson, now, you may not have picked up on that, but he was, he he's was doctor. the doctor. Yes, he was. A good one. A and, great one. And, and now, it's important to note because you, so many of those guys today still limp yeah. from that, <laughs> from that time. <laughs> no, that's not true. Bob. He was a, Gary was a great doctor. And Boy, they really they, had to do it then, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they did. They really had to do it. I mean, that's before they had a lot of the, you know, yeah. rubber casts and the balloons yeah. and those things. Yeah. They really had to go out and yeah. put them together with guns, right. didn't they? They, uh, they really did that. Dr. Johnson did a great job. He was dedicated to the job. That's the key to all of it. And Don Falls, and he was dedicated to the job, too. So Just think was, what they didn't know about medicine back then, either, yeah. 25 years ago, when yeah. he had to just put folks back well, together. I think they've done a lot with the knee since that time. Mm -hmm. Other than that, they knew about everything. But the knee has been a lot of improvement in the knee, how to take care of that. And I think that's a big improvement. What was there? It was the first year you beat Florida in Gainesville. And I, and I want to talk about that a little bit. But I, I don't know if, if anything will be remembered more than the 37-37 uh, the tie at Alabama. Uh, that uh, was, it may have been one of those things that just threw us right up on the map. Yeah. Well, it was a great game. There was no question about it. It was one of the best games I've ever seen. Yeah, just, I, I just the game itself, yeah, step yeah, back away. And uh, uh, we, were, we were thrilled. And, of course, I, I really honestly think I lost the game because uh, Don Bro, who's now with the Washington Redskins, was on the sideline. I said, Don, uh, how about the halfback throwback to the quarterback? Don said, good, but we had the wrong quarterback in there. And so he didn't call the right formation. They intercepted and took a 50-yard line, scored right before the half. And we were leading them pretty good. We were leading them by uh, at least nine or ten points at that time. So we went in at halftime leading by two. But uh, I, I think if I, I've always thought if I hadn't have called that play at that time or if I had been sure that the right quarterback was in there, why? Uh, because we only rehearsed it with one quarterback because he could do it so well, and that was Gary Padgett. But uh, anyhow, uh, it was a great game. 37-37, <clears throat> forget Florida State for a minute. Just the game itself had to yeah. be just spectacular yeah, back and know. forth. Ball. Gary, I want to tell you what this team was like, this 67 team. We were behind it, it, with about two and a half minutes to go in the ball game, and they kick off to us. They just scored, and we get the ball at the 20-yard line, and they, they took it for 80 yards to, to score and, and tie the ball game. It really uh, was a, you know, that was, that was a great character and a great bunch of guys, it really was. Was it, a, were you seven down there? Yeah, seven down. We went for the one point. I, you know, I, I don't agree with other people about the two points. I don't think it's like kissing your sister. I think at that time it was what the game means to, to the team that you, that you're coaching. And at that time, for us to tie Alabama was the same as a win. Mm -hmm. And they come off, the players come off the, uh, the field and said, hey, coach, they want to go for the two points. I said, you tell them we're going for the one. Because I, if we lose a ball game, it's, you know, it's nothing. But if we tie it, it meant a lot to us, and, and, and they still talk about the game. I don't know what Bob feels about it, but that's the way I feel about it. Are you? <laughs> well, there's a, there, I have a lot of memories about that 67 season. Mm -hmm. And 
one of them that uh, Pete got sick before the VPI game, and the only game in my life I was ever head coach. He picked a bad one, because VPI, as you recall, back mm -hmm. in 64, they was a team that beat us. And uh, if you want to have some tension, I really feel uh, you're up for a game, why, I, I try that one one time. <laughs> and the uh, Penn State game, we were down 17 nothing at halftime. And uh, yep. came back and tied that football game. And they, they just a lot of interesting things happened in there. Well, let's and, go to uh, Gainesville, Coach. It's the first time you beat Florida down there. Right. Tell me about that ball game. Well, you know, the big play was it there, uh, uh, throwing the touchdown pass in there. And, and, uh, that was Seller. Set to Sellers, you know, and after Hammond had been knocked out and they carried him off the field, you know, practically, and then he comes back and throws that one. But uh, we played real good defense against them, and of course, you know, the first win down there was like, was real, real important to us and to everybody that we could win away from home and beat Florida on their own home field. And that, I thought, was a pretty good accomplishment. But there was a lot of things happening in that uh, particular season. The first ball, the first game we played Houston, and they practically uh, just demolished us, you know. And uh, we got off to awful slow start in there. And then after time, Alabama, why uh, North Carolina State beat us. And then finally, we got put it together a little bit. And you won seven straight days. Yeah. Right, and yeah. then went on, which kind of yeah. a little Strange bit unusual, yeah. you know. Yeah. I, I remember after the uh, Houston game, uh, coaching defense, and they had a lot of points on us, you know. Uh, what were we going to do, you know? And uh, talking to defensive staff, why I said, uh, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to find the 11 best tacklers we got, and then we're going to play a defense that fits them. Hmm. And so we, we changed up a defensive scheme uh, practically entirely after that, and uh, and it got to kind of rolling out there and become a little better defensive team. Now, he was talking about Don Bro there. Why, uh, I, uh, we, we had another guy on there that named Joe Gibbs is a pretty good assistant coach, too, at that time. You know? yeah. So I learned a good bit of football, coach defense against him, coach and offense. Well, you haven't moved through, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you know, the interesting thing, two of the players that played on that team was uh, Wayne McDuffie, who's the offensive coordinator now, and uh, and Larry Pendleton, who weighed about 185 pounds, and uh, he, they played. I think Kenny Hart, who's an attorney here, uh, Rhodes, Billy Rhodes, uh, Jack I think Finley, Jack yeah. Fenwick's here. Is a, 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 yeah, and uh, Thurston Taylor's in Atlanta. I think he's a coach. Yeah, I know he's a coach. Had a great season last year. We haven't talked about the one guy, though. Yeah, and we haven't talked about the, the great... The one guy. Yeah, the Sellers. <laughs> well, he really was. Yeah, you compare I, him to Belitnikov. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't want to pick one over the other. They just both were great great athletes, the best in the country. Hands. They had great and that hands. That was the best thing they That's had. right. Uh, Sellers had a little bit more height than, uh, than Blittenkopf. He was a little faster than Blittenkopf. Well, everybody And they was both had great, great right? courage, and that was the key to all of it. Yeah. And uh, they, they took coaching, you know. It was just really, they were just two great, great players. There. Coach, I, 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 got, I can't let you go without talking about that Florida game a little bit more, because uh, uh, Hammond was goofy. I mean, yeah. he was just, he was out of it. Oh, yeah. What what decision, what went through your mind uh, that, that lets you send him back in? Well, here's what happened on the thing. When he was hurt, I went on the field. And they, they had literally just about tore his head off. And they didn't give him a penalty. And I took, said to those officials, I said, you see that side? And do you see that side? I said, if by gosh, they're going to be able to be down on him if you don't start calling them right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, he, when he come off the field, he was all right. We got it half. I, I said, let me know when he could go back in. At halftime, they said he's completely out. So uh, Dr. Johnson wasn't with us at that time. He had, in 55, he had, or 65, he had left and went mm -hmm. into uh, uh, practice. And uh, so I, I forget the doctor's name, but uh, he, I said to him, to Don Falls and him, I said, stay with him. When he gets ready, bring him out. And when they brought him out to the field, I looked around and there he is, and I said, go throw long. I didn't even tell him to play or anything. And it was and he, two plays, wasn't it? Three Bang, plays. We ran a one pass and then run to Larry Green, and who was the, a halfback, and then, and then the Sellers a touchdown. And that's three. We went 90, 98 or 96 yards. Showed your carriage there, Coach. Okay, well, that's, uh, you know, that was the great 67 season. And it you was are a going great to team. See. It really was. And, you know, was it better than Gary, the one thing we have to say, huh? Better than 64? I don't know about that. But, one was uh, Calvin. One. Not as, Not as talent, no. But one thing I have to say about that is when they were back here, with, and Harvey with, and I were there, I think it was last year that they were back. They had a 67-year team. Every one of those gentlemen are successful. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Kim Hammond's a judge. Uh, 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 well, you just went the guy to the Ken doctor. Hart's an attorney here. Yeah, the attorney, and uh, got some nice and uh, Thurston Taylor's a, a, a coach. Uh, uh, Billy Rhodes has bees. I don't know. <laughs> he has honey bees, you know. And uh, Phil Spooner. Phil Spooner is uh, no, no, has he's on safety court. Yeah. yeah, but uh, uh, it, it, it just well, coach, let's see. People. We're going to see okay. 767 right. now. This was a, a great year for Florida State, obviously, just to go down to Gainesville, win that ball game, and. Uh, and the, the sophistication, I guess, of the coaching that, that lets you make some of the decisions that these guys had to make along the line to get them where they needed to be. We hope you enjoyed the highlights at 67. started in mediocrity and wound up in a blaze of glory. A season which saw the Seminoles defeat arch rival Florida in Gainesville for the first time. Climax by a bid to play Penn State in the Gator Bowl. In 67, Florida State presented its most exciting team with quarterback Kim Hammond and flanker Ron Sellers combining to make up the nation's best pitch and catch team. Sellers, a junior from Jacksonville, went on to become Florida State's second consensus All-America. While Hammond, the sub when the season started, gained two second string All-America berths and came in fifth in the Heisman voting. Hammond and Sellers were the only heroes. There was Bill Mormon and Larry Green in the offensive backfield, plus an interior line whose pass protection rivals that of any in the nation. There were defensive standouts, such as Bob Menendez, plus linebackers Mike Flatt and Dale McCullough, a defensive secondary that made it tougher on opponents as the season progressed. The Seminoles' staunchest supporters were pretty discouraged as their team was 0-2-1 after the first three games. However, a sensational 37-37 tie with mighty Alabama soothed some of the disappointment. Coach Bill Peterson's crew got back on the right track with a late-game triumph over Texas A&M, and the Seminoles were on the warpath. The best team in Florida State history, according to most state sports writers, then went on to reel off seven straight victories. This is one game Florida State fans will cherish for a long time to come. 21-point underdog, the Seminoles jump in front, fall behind, then rally late in the game to tie the Crimson Tide. The action starts early as five linebacker Dale McCall scoops up a Joe Kelly fumble in the second play of the game. With Larry Green picking up 33 yards in three carries for most of the yardage, the Seminoles break the scoring ice when Tim Hammond hits Ron Sellers on this 12-yard touchdown pass. The game's most exciting play and one which gives the Seminoles impetus for the rest of the evening comes less than two minutes later. Walt Sumner gathers in a Steve Davis punt and rambles 75 yards down the sidelines to put the drive in front 14 minutes. Alabama coach Bear Bryant quickly removes senior quarterback Tim Stabler from his doghouse and following a Seminole fumble at the 15, the Snake scores the tie's first TD on a two-yard plus. On the last play of the first quarter, Stabler strikes again, this time on a spectacular 51-yard bomb to Dennis Holman. A two-point conversion puts the tie on top for the first time, 15-14. yard run by Hammond as he scrambles away from Packers keeps the Seminole momentum going. And Grant Guthrie's toe adds the points on the first of three field goals. This one, a 27 yard move. The Seminoles are threatening again, but this pass by Bill Mormon is intercepted and returned 58 yards by Alabama's Mike Ford. Back Ed Morgan puts the Crimson Tide back in front with a hard-earned 10 yards up the middle. Hammond leads the Seminoles right back, however, as he connects with Larry Green for a Seminole touchdown in the closing minutes of the half. And 71,299 fans watch in disbelief, Florida State takes a 24-22 lead at intermission. 
second half opens with Hammond connecting on a 34 yard pass to Sellers. Moments later, Guthrie splits the uprights as the drive increases its lead to 27 to 22. Early in the final stanza, Alabama regains the lead on a 17 yard touchdown pass from Staper to Homer. A two point conversion puts the tide on top, 30 to 27. But again, Hammond leads the Seminoles back. Here he picks up 18 yards on a quarterback draw. 